So um, it's my pleasure to introduce James Nakamura from Purdue University, who um, uh, will tell us about the experiments done uh, to observe fractional statistics using a Fabry-Perot interferometer. James? Uh, okay, so can you all uh, hear me and see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Uh, yep. Okay, uh, great. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to uh, talk today. And so today I'm going to be telling you about our work uh, showing evidence for observation of anionic statistics through interferometry. And this is work uh, that I participated in in the lab of Professor uh, Michael Manfra at Purdue University. So uh, I'll get uh, right into it. So of course, Steve gave us a Good introduction this morning to the uh, background here, uh, but I'll rehash some of the important ideas. So the quantum Hall regime is uh, very interesting, has a lot of very remarkable properties, uh, but what we're going to be looking at today is uh, one of the most interesting ones, which is the uh, fractional quasi-particles that are predict predicted to exist at fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, so these uh, fractional quasi-particles have two interesting properties that we're going to look at. So they're predicted to carry a fraction of an electron's charge. So the one third state is predicted to have one third of an electron's charge. And this generalizes to uh, various other fractional quantum Hall states. Um, and then they're also predicted to obey uh, fractional or anionic statistics. And the way this is envisioned to work is that you take uh, one quasi particle and uh, braid it in a loop around the other. You get a change in phase that's a fraction of two pi. So for the one third state, it's predicted to be two pi over three. And this uh, braiding process is equivalent to two uh, exchanges of the quasi-particles positions. And so something you might notice is uh, the way uh, we're defining the phase here is uh, a little bit different from the way it was defined uh, in the previous talk. And the reason for that is that in this uh, uh, work, we're looking at a braiding process, which is equivalent to two quasi-particle exchanges. So we're uh, different by a factor of two, uh, but it's just a convention, no uh, difference in uh, the physics there. Uh, so it's important to put our work in uh, the context of previous experiments uh, probing these quasi-particles. Uh, so as was uh, mentioned before, um, the fractional charge, that first really interesting property uh, that I mentioned, has been observed in uh, previous experiments uh, over 20 years ago now. Uh, first from for the uh, new equals one-third state where there's the E over three charge, and then those uh, um, uh, shot noise experiments that uh, were used to show that uh, have been extended to various other fractional quantum Hall states observing other uh, fractional charges, including uh, E over four for the five halves fractional quantum Hall state. And I'll be telling you about our interference experiments today. Um, so uh, I'll uh, <clears throat> briefly talk about previous uh, interference experiments that have been done in the quantum Hall regime. Uh, and a significant number of those have been uh, spearheaded by the Heiblum group at the Wiseman Institute. Uh, showing interference of um, both integer and fractional quantum Hall states in uh, various types of interferometers. And uh, several other groups have also done uh, interference experiments in the quantum Hall regime, including the uh, uh, Marcus group at uh, Harvard showing interference and um, some very uh, compelling uh, work by Bob Willett at Bell Labs uh, showing evidence for interference at the new equals five halves fractional quantum Hall state. And uh, again, that's very uh, uh, exciting and compelling because uh, it may have applications for topological quantum computing. And now getting to some uh, recent and very uh, important work. Um, uh, recently there was a uh, showed obs observation of half integer thermal uh, Hall conductance uh, by the, again, by the Heiblum group, uh, which is uh, exciting again uh, at the new, this is at the new equals five half state, which uh, may have applications for topological quantum computing. And then, of course, the uh, most recent uh, uh, work to acknowledge is the work we just heard all about, um, great work showing observation of anionic statistics through quasi-particle collisions. And the way our uh, work today fits into these previous experiments is we have a, another way for uh, showing evidence for anionic statistics, and this time through an ex uh, interference experiment. <clears throat> so we're thinking about a phase, so it's natural to think of observing that through interference. Uh, so now I'll give a quick overview of how our experiment is supposed to work. Uh, so we're uh, working with the electronic equivalent of a Fabry-Perot interferometer. And we have a gallium arsenide two-dimensional electron gas and then use metal gates to define an interference path. 
And we're in the quantum hole regime, so current travels along the edge of the sample. So our device consists of two quantum point contacts to uh, act as beam splitters and partition the current. And the way this works is current will come in from the source contact and can be partially reflected by the first quantum point contact, with the rest of the current going on through the device and can be reflected by the second quantum point contact and the rest of the current going to the drain contact. And um, now we have these two backscattered paths that can give interference. And of course, the total backscattered current will depend on the individual backscattering amplitudes of these two point contacts. But it'll, there'll also be a cross term that depends on the uh, phase difference and uh, it's governed by the interference. And we could measure this by uh, measuring the current or uh, measuring the electrical conductance across our device. And if we're just uh, interfering electrons, for example, at an integer quantum hole state, uh, then the phase difference will be just the on off bohm phase of electrons moving in a high magnetic field. And you can envision uh, changing this in two ways. First of all, by changing the uh, voltage on these gates that define the area of the interferometer or by changing the magnetic fields to directly change the flux. And the key thing is, uh, as Steve alluded to earlier, that when you do this experiment, what you'd expect to see since this phase is a product of the area and magnetic field, uh, we measure the conductance uh, across the device as a function of those uh, things, the magnetic field and gate voltage, you'd expect to see lines of constant conductance or constant phase that have a negative slope in this B and VG plane. So now uh, that's for integer quantum hole states. And if we uh, go to a fractional quantum hole state, we'd expect this phase to be modified in two ways. First of all, the Arnov bohm part should be scaled by the quasi-particle charge because we're not interfering just electrons anymore. We're interfering these fractional particles. And then also, if there happen to be any quasi-particles localized inside our interferometer, uh, our interference paths have braided around these uh, localized charges. And so there should be an extra term uh, given by the anionic phase times the number of quasi-particles in the device. So this experiment should give us a way to probe uh, fractional charge, uh, which has been observed before in previous experiments, and then uh, also the anionic statistics. Now, there ends up being a problem with this uh, if you just jump into these experiments, which, um, so remember, I, I mentioned that the expectation is you'll see negatively sloped lines of constant phase if you do the experiment. But what's usually seen if you uh, um, just try to naively jump into this is the opposite behavior. You see positively sloped lines of constant conductance. So something strange is going on here that needs to be understood. And an explanation from this uh, came from uh, theoretical works, which uh, explained that as the uh, magnetic field is changed, Coulomb charging effects can cause the area of the device to change as you change magnetic field. Uh, so you can't change the area and magnetic field independently like you'd like to. So this is a uh, strange effect where you can have the flux through the device actually decrease when you increase the magnetic field, which is where the uh, positive slope comes from. And the big problem with, the, with these Coulomb effects is that if you're in the uh, so-called Coulomb dominated regime where you have this uh, positive slope behavior, it's been shown that uh, the br uh, braiding is unobservable. So there's this close correspondence in the quantum Hall regime between charge and phase uh, that makes it impossible to see braiding when you're in this regime. So in order to get this experiment to work, we need to uh, suppress these Coulomb charging effects somehow in order to uh, get back to the arnold bohm regime. Uh, so in previous uh, experiments, as I mentioned, uh, early experiments tended to see this Coulomb-dominated behavior with a positive slope. Uh, but it was found that uh, you could go, uh, go from uh, positive slope to negative slope, so transition from the Coulomb-dominated to arnold bohm regime by putting a large metal gate on top of your interferometer. And what's happening is this large metal gate on the surface is screening those Coulomb charging effects and uh, recovering the AB behavior. Uh, the problem with this was for, for to get enough capacitance to screen effectively, this device needs to be large. And um, with a large device, you end up having poor phase coherence. So the uh, amplitude of the interference in these large devices was small and uh, lim limited to uh, integer quantum hall states. So what we need is a, a better way to screen in order to get uh, arnold bohm regime interference in the smaller devices. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, our solution to this problem was to engineer the uh, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide heterostructure that our two-dimensional electron gases are living in. And what we did was we, uh, so a typical structure uh, for these types of experiments would have a single gallium arsenide quantum well or a single uh, interface where the electron system resides. But for our structure, we grew an additional uh, quantum well above and below the main quantum well, 
which will have uh, additional electrons in them whose purpose is to screen the Coulomb charging effects. So these extra wells, the screening wells, are, are intended to act like those uh, metal plates in the previous uh, experiments, uh, except that we can get better screening because uh, we can, as since they're grown as part of the structure, you could put uh, them closer to the quantum well and uh, also put one on each side, so uh, twice as much screening. And we've designed this structure uh, to have a short setback of these screening wells from the main quantum well, uh, and also to have high electron density in these uh, screening wells compared to the uh, main quantum well in order to make sure that we uh, get good screening. Now, if you know much about these types of experiments, you may have noticed a problem with this idea, which is that we've, in this case, intentionally induced a huge amount of parallel conduction into our structure. So parallel conduction is a, generally a problem for quantum Hall effect because it obscures the uh, quantum Hall states and uh, would make our experiment a, a big mess. So in order to solve this problem, we've borrowed a technique that's been used in bilayer quantum Hall systems in uh, previous experiments and put uh, metal gates on the top side and back side of our uh, chip that go around the uh, ohmic contacts. And what we're gonna do is use those metal gates to deplete the uh, screening wells, just deplete the screening wells to disconnect the ohmics from the contacts. So we'll put negative voltage on the top gate, deplete the top screening well, and then do the same for the bottom gate and deplete the bottom screening well, just in this region around the contacts so that the screening wells are still available to screen in the center of where our uh, devices. So now we're where we want to be, which is uh, remo having removed the uh, parallel conduction and probing just the main quantum well. So the first thing we want to do is test if this screening well scheme really works and uh, screens Coulomb charging effects. And in order to do this, uh, we've characterized the device uh, by um, uh, measuring zero magnetic field Coulomb blockade oscillation. So operating our interferometer first as a quantum dot in the Coulomb blockade regime and measuring the uh, differential conductance as a function of uh, gate voltage and source drain bias. And when you do this, you get this characteristic uh, Coulomb diamond pattern in the differential conductance. And from the height of these diamonds, you can get the characteristic Coulomb charging energy. So for a device with screening wells, that uh, uh, charging energy is uh, very small compared to a similarly sized device that does not have the screening well, so about an order of magnitude difference. So this tells us that the uh, screening wells really work. They re there's a really uh, dramatic reduction in uh, Coulomb charging effects. And there's another possible advantage of this screening well scheme, which is that uh, from our uh, collaborators doing numerical simulations, it appears that the screening well structure results in a sharper confining potential at the uh, edge of the gates. So the top left, this is a plot of uh, simulations of the uh, density in the screening well structure compared to a single interface structure, which is a standard structure without the screening wells. And what you can, uh, the density at the edge of the gate. And what you can see is for the screening well structure, the density goes up from zero where it's fully depleted to the full density uh, much more quickly than for the single interface structure. So the confining potential is sharper. <clears throat> and a qualitative way to understand why this should be is that the screening well, uh, everywhere the screening well is populated will uh, block the gate voltage from hitting the main quantum well. So the uh, screening well, though, will only be depleted uh, in an area under the gate once we put the gate voltage on. So it effectively creates a mask so that the quantum well feels the potential only in this uh, sharply defined region defined by this uh, mask of the screening well. So that's just a qualitative way to get a sense of why this should occur. And uh, so there's some experimental evidence for this, which is that if we look at uh, sweeps of the QPC uh, voltage and measure the conductance, uh, this here just at the new equal one state, what we can see in the screening well structure is that there's a very uh, abrupt pinch off going from the full E squared over H conductance to zero. Whereas in a standard uh, structure, the, there's a much more gradual drop from the full conductance to zero. And this gives us uh, an idea that the uh, confining potential really is sharper in our screening well structure. And the um, reason this confining potential may be helpful is that the uh, current along the edge of the sample, the edge states are driven by the confining potential, the electric field at the edge. So you should get a higher edge state velocity with a uh, sharper confining potential, which would improve coherence in our interferometers. And uh, this may also uh, limit the effects of edge state reconstruction that could uh, give uh, extra neutral mode to lead to dephasing. So the real test of this is to measure inter met operator devices and interferometer and measure interference. So we've done this at the, uh, in the integer quantum Hall regime first here at the 
nu equals one, uh, uh, operator devices interferometer and measured conductance as a function of magnetic field and gate voltage. And when we, when we do this, we see uh, the, the lines of constant uh, phase do indeed have negative slope in this, in this plane. So that tells us that we've suppressed the Coulomb effects enough to get ourselves into the Arnold-Ohm regime and away from uh, the Coulomb-dominated regime. Uh, so that's good. That means the screening wells do, do work. And uh, what's important is we are able to do this in a device that's very small, about 20 times smaller than those uh, devices that just have the metal gates on the surface. And because our device is small, the uh, coherence is very high and the interference is robust. So the amplitude here is uh, large and the interference survives up to pretty high temperatures of a, a few hundred millikelvin. And uh, we uh, published a previous paper uh, on, these, uh, on this work in Nature Physics. Uh, so next, we want to see uh, if we can observe interference in the fractional quantum Hall regime. So we go to the nu equals one third uh, fractional quantum Hall state and do the same experiment. So we measure conductance as a function of magnetic field and gate voltage. And here we see something similar to what was observed at nu equals one. So the uh, behavior you see here is uh, mainly you see these uh, negatively sloped lines of constant phase in our conductance oscillations. Uh, so that's good. We're still in the Arnold-Bohm regime at, for this fractional state. Um, however, you, what you can see here is there, uh, this interference pattern is not a perfect Arnold-Bohm pattern. It looks like there are a few uh, glitches in the pattern or discrete jumps in the phase. And this is intriguing to see because remember, the, for a fractional quantum Hall state, we would expect the phase to be a combination of the Arnold-Bohm part uh, plus a discreetly uh, varying part uh, that should change when the number of localized quasi-particles in the device changes. So we uh, would like to see if these discrete phase jumps can be explained by uh, anionic statistics. Uh, so to estimate uh, how large each phase jump is, what we've done is done a least squares fit in these regions between the phase jumps, uh, fitting the uh, conductance to an Arnold-Bohm pattern where the phase is a combination of the Arnold-Bohm phase plus some extra phase uh, theta naught that's our fitting parameter and then calculate the change in phase as uh, delta theta across uh, the change in theta naught across each um, one of these phase jumps. And if we do this, we see that the phase jumps are not all exactly the same. Uh, there's some uh, variation here, but if we take the average of uh, these phase jumps, the average value is about minus 0 0.31 uh, times two pi. Now remember the uh, predicted value for, an for the anions at one third would be a two pi over three. So it kind of seems like we're off by a sign factor here, but actually the expectation is that when you go up in magnetic field, you'll tend to remove quasi particles or possibly add uh, quasi holes. So in that case, you would, you would get a phase change of negative two pi over three. So in fact, our uh, average value here is close to the expected value for uh, predict expected for anionic behavior. Uh, so we take this as evidence that these phase jumps correspond uh, to observation of anionic statistics at the one-third state. Uh, so the data I showed so far uh, it was uh, taken from near the center of the new equals one-third uh, state. Um, uh, however, um, the one-third plateau and zero in RxX extends to significantly higher uh, magnetic field um, at higher and lower magnetic field. And if we continue the measurement out to higher field and lower field, uh, we see a change in behavior. So at the center, we saw these negatively sloped lines with just a few little discrete jumps in there. But if we go to higher and lower field, something interesting happens, which is the lines of constant phase appear to flatten out or become uh, nearly independent of magnetic field. So this is some uh, interesting behavior we need to try to understand. And uh, there was a recent theoretical analysis of this situation uh, by Bern Rosenau and Adi Stern, um, which uh, considered this situation and specifically looked at the competition between the energy cost to create quasi particles, that's basically the energy gap delta, and the electrostatic energy cost uh, required to avoid creating quasi particles and keep the filling factor new fixed with, when you uh, change magnetic field across the uh, state. Um, so what the authors uh, found is that uh, they predicted a transition from seeing primarily Arnov bone behavior with a super periodic oscillations, the three finite period oscillations due to the fact for fractional charge at the uh, center of the state. And then when the uh, magnetic field is lowered to some critical value, there should be a transition where quasi particles start to be created 
with each uh, change by phi naught. And then there would be a change in period to phi naught from the three phi naught. So the idea is that at the center, the chemical potential is inside the gap, so you're not creating many quasi-particles. Go down a magnetic field and you'll start creating a quasi-particle with each uh, flux quantum when you're in the regime where the density of states is high. And there should also be a particle hole conjugate to this, where if you go to high magnetic field, you'll reach a critical field where um, the uh, chemical potential will be in the uh, whole density, density of states, and you'll be creating a quasi hole each time you change by phi naught. And there again, you'll get a, the authors expect a shift to a phi naught period oscillation. And importantly, um, this uh, regime where it's predicted to see primarily RNA Bohm interference uh, uh, matches uh, our data where we should see uh, mainly these negatively sloped oscillations with a large period, approximately three phi naught, in the center of the plateau. And the authors give us a uh, equation for how wide that region should be in uh, terms of magnetic field. And uh, this equation uh, depends on the gap. So the gap determines how far you need to move in units of uh, energy to, in order to start creating quasi particles or quasi holes. And then the rest of these terms um, determine how the chemical potential moves with energy. And the important th term here is this uh, C, the capacitance per unit area, uh, which uh, comes from our screening and um, determines uh, how much energy builds up when you uh, uh, keep the filling factor fixed uh, as you're sweeping the magnetic field. So uh, this gives us a, a way to look at our data and to see if it makes sense based on this theory. So uh, if we look at our region where you primarily see these negatively sloped lines of constant phase, there's a width of about 450 millitesla. Um, and if we uh, take the equation from that theoretical work and plug in the parameters for our system, so delta is something that can be just measured from transport, and um, the capacitance per unit area is something that's uh, set by our heterostructure and the setback of these screening wells, uh, we calculate a value, a predicted value of about 530 millitesla. So there's pretty good agreement between this region where we see the Arnold Bohm interference and uh, this predicted value from the uh, equation in the paper. So this gives us an idea that this uh, theoretical work can indeed explain why we see this uh, transition when going away from the central region. On the other hand, there's a question here that remains, which is that another prediction from the authors is that when you go to high and low fields, you should see a transition to uh, seeing uh, phi naught period oscillations. Whereas for us, we just seem to see a, uh, the, the oscillations become nearly independent of magnetic field. And there's a sort of qualitative way you can understand why the oscillation period would, the oscillations would flatten out and uh, not depend on B anymore, which is that uh, from some simple arithmetic, you can see if you change the flux by one phi naught, you get a change in the Arnold Bohm phase by two pi over three. But you should also be removing a quasi particle or adding a quasi hole if you're in uh, one of these regions, which will give you a change in phase by negative two pi over three. So on average, there's zero change in phase. So being independent of the magnetic field kind of makes sense. But of course, the uh, Arnold Bohm part is uh, continuous and the uh, uh, anionic part would be discrete. So you'd still expect to see fi the finite peri period modulations. Uh, on the other hand, the, the authors of this theoretical work also predicted that the uh, uh, temperature scale for those uh, finite period oscillations should be very small, just a few millikelvin, whereas uh, in our cryostat is only a uh, 10 millikelvin and the electrons themselves, uh, based on some uh, cool on blockade measurements we've done are a little bit warmer than that, around 20 millikelvin. So in fact, in our device, we'd expect the phi naught period oscillations to be thermally smeared and to just see uh, these flat lines of constant phase. So our observations actually still seem to be consistent with the uh, predictions. And a qualitative way, or a way you can understand the uh, high degree of smearing is that, that uh, these uh, high and low field regions correspond to a high quasi-particle and quasi-hole density of states. Uh, so the only thing keeping a lot of quasi-particles or holes flooding into our device in that regime is um, the charging energy, the electrostatic energy cost of adding more charge. And that will also be pretty small because the quasi-particle charge is small and the, uh, our device has a lot of screening. By necessity, our device has a lot of screening. So based on this, we uh, seem to need an explanation for why we would see discrete jumps in phase at the center of the uh, plateau. And, uh, Explanation for this is that, so the density of states uh, for any quantum Hall state is not gonna be a perfect delta function. 
there's always going to be some broadening due to disorder. So it may be that there's um, some uh, localized states that are at lower energy due to uh, the hills and valleys and the disorder potential. And when we sweep the magnetic field, uh, we sweep through those uh, states and see that are able to see those transitions. And uh, due to disorder, they can be separated from the other states uh, by a significant amount of energy so that they don't thermally smear together. And uh, if these uh, discrete jumps are indeed explained by uh, disorder giving uh, localized states, that might, may explain why they appear to be unevenly spaced. So these uh, jumps are not something periodic. They appear to be roughly uh, more or less randomly distributed. Okay, so now to uh, get some additional understanding of how our device operates, we've done some analysis of the uh, lever arm of the side gates that we're using to change the area. So we mainly think of these side gates as uh, uh, just coupling to the area of the device, uh, but they're not perfectly lateral, right? There's some depth to the two dig, so that, uh, they'll end up also having some uh, connection and lever arm to the charge in the bulk of our device. So to understand this, we first uh, measure zero magnetic field uh, Coulomb blockade oscillations, which I discussed earlier. And at zero magnetic field, there's no distinction between the bulk and the edge. So in that regime, the uh, oscillation period we see should correspond to removing one, one electron uh, from anywhere in the device. And that should give us the total lever arm coupling the gates to uh, the interferometer. So the combined coupling to the edge and to the bulk. On the other hand, if we operate a device as an interferometer for, uh, here just at the nu equals one state, uh, in that case, uh, the oscillations in the phase only depend on the area. So char changing charge in the bulk won't uh, change the phase. So in this case, uh, the oscillation period can be used to get just the coupling of the gate to the edge. And uh, what we're very interested in uh, for this analysis I'm going to discuss later is the uh, coupling to the bulk, so alpha bulk. Um, and to get that, uh, we assume that the uh, total coupling is a combination of the coupling to the edge and the coupling to, bulk, to the bulk. So to get alpha bulk, we just take the difference. And if we do this, uh, we see that the uh, coupling to the edge is stronger than the coupling to the bulk, which uh, reflects the idea that these are side gates that primarily affect, affect the area but there's uh, some significant coupling to the bulk as well, which will affect operation. Uh, so what we're gonna use this analysis for is to try to understand some, in some more interesting behavior, which is that we observe that in the uh, central region, um, there's a larger gate voltage oscillation period compared to in the high and low, or the high and low field regions where the uh, uh, lines of constant phase uh, flattened out. And a possible explanation for this is that so in the central region, our picture is that the density of states is small. So when you change the uh, gate voltage, you'll primarily just be uh, changing the phase through the uh, Arnov bohm phase. Whereas in these high and low field regions, you have a high density of states. So you can also change the phase by inducing some quasi particles or quasi holes. So there should be, uh, in the, these regions, there should be an additional term from the coupling of the bulk uh, through creating quasi particles to how the phase changes with gate voltage. Uh, so if we use this uh, relationship for how the phase should change with uh, depending on the alpha edge and the alpha bulk, we can predict what the uh, periods would be based on these lever arms we pulled out. And if we do this, um, we find that there's a pretty good agreement between the observed periods and the uh, uh, period that would be predicted based on uh, these parameters. So this gives us another indication that our uh, picture of uh, there being low density of states and not many quasi particles in the central region, and then in the high and low field regions, you see the influence of the anionic statistics, that that picture uh, is valid for our device. So there's another observation that we can uh, try to understand based on these uh, coupling parameters, which is that uh, if you look at these discrete jumps in phase, uh, they appear to have a positive slope in the magnetic field and gate voltage plane. And uh, this is interesting. So if we think these uh, discrete jumps in phase may be uh, transitions in the quasi-particle number, this positive slope would be similar to uh, previous experiments, uh, previous uh, resonant tunneling type experiments uh, where the conductance peaks correspond to transitions in the localized particle number and a positive slope is also observed for those types of experiments. And the uh, way to understand this is that, as I mentioned, if you increase the magnetic field, you'll tend to remove quasi-particles. Whereas if you increase gate voltage, you'll, the increasing gate voltage will tend to add more charge, so add quasi-particles. 
So a positive slope makes sense. And we can quantitatively compare uh, this uh, slope to what would be expected based on these uh, cup coupling parameters that uh, we pulled out before. So the idea is that the quasi-particle should enter or leave when the electrostatic energy uh, cost uh, exceeds the energy cost of the, the energy of the quasi-particle. So then the slope of these uh, uh, dis uh, discrete jumps in phase should uh, correspond to constant electrostatic energy and then you go over uh, in magnetic field or gate voltage and the transition will happen, which should correspond to uh, constant uh, net charge on the uh, device. And the net charge on the device will be a combination of several things, the charge in the condensate, uh, plus the charge of any quasi-particles that are already there, and then uh, the background charge and the contribution from the uh, coupling of the gates to the bulk if we're bearing the gate voltage. So we can take this and find what the uh, slope of gate voltage versus magnetic field would be to give you a constant net charge. And if we do this, uh, we can calculate that value, which is about 0 0.44 millivolts per millitesla. And we can compare that to the slope observed for these uh, transitions, which is about 0 0.5 millivolts per millitesla. So this good agreement between the observed slope and the slope that you would predict based on these parameters gives us uh, some additional uh, confidence that these dis uh, transition, these uh, discrete jumps in phase do indeed correspond to transitions in the number of localized quasi-particles. So the last thing I'll get to here is um, another observation, which is that in each one of these uh, regimes, so the low field, the high field, and the central region, we observe that the oscillations uh, decay with temperature with an approximately exponential dependence. But something interesting is that we observe that the uh, temperature scale uh, extracted from the exponential pit uh, is, about, is significantly smaller in the low and high field regions compared to the central region. So a possible explanation for this is that in the central region, the uh, chemical potential is in the dense, is in the gap. So uh, there's not much chance of having extra quasi-particles jump in and out, whereas in these uh, uh, outside regions, the density of states is high, uh, so it's easy to get more quasi-particles across quasi-holes. So you may have significant thermal smearing of the number of localized quasi-particles inside the device. So that could give you an additional thermal uh, dephasing mechanism. And um, this possibility uh, for uh, another dephasing mechanism was discussed in a previous theoretical work um, for quantum fractional interferometers. All right, so getting to conclusions. So at the new equals one third state, we have observed a discrete jumps in phase with an average value of about minus 0 0.31, uh, which is consistent with what would be expected for anionic braiding statistics. And uh, we see a transition in interference behavior when moving away from the new equals one third state, uh, consistent with this uh, recent theory by uh, Rosenau and Stern uh, which uh, would imply the effects of anionic braiding statistics as well. So we think the simplest explanation for our observations is uh, that we are uh, seeing the effect of anionic statistics in our device. And we think these observations provide additional support uh, on top of the uh, previous experiment uh, in the presentation this morning uh, for anionic statistics at the one third state. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, James. Um... I think uh, there are a number of questions. Um, I think, um, yeah, we will have some time. So I see mostly questions from the comment. Um, so let me go back here. Okay, the first question is by uh, our own Val Fat Fatemi. Um, is the huge jump um, in contrast at the point of the first phase slip a coincidence? I think yeah, that was related to uh, the oscillations versus gate and field plot uh, on the first slides. So, um, is a the huge jump a the one meaning the large jump uh, that has a larger value? Is that just a coincidence? Um, so I know the, the on the left side, the oscillation contrast seems to step oh. up along along with the phase slip. Oh, okay, yes, I think that is just a coincidence um, that there's some variation in the backscattering amplitude with the magnetic field that's uh, we don't fully control. Um, 
that gives the reduction in amplitude there. So that's, that's not a general feature uh, that we have observed. Okay, um, the next question is by Salius. Um, and the question is, can you please elaborate on how you did, uh, you fit the data? Uh, right, so uh, what we've done is a least squares fit and we're in each one of these regions between the, uh, uh, where the discrete phase jumps occur, we fit it to this form. So we assume the, delta, the change in uh, conductance is equal to uh, some uh, oscillation amplitude for which we put in the uh, uh, apparent amplitude there uh, with the phase being a combination of an Arnov bohm phase, uh, the area assumed from um, the new equals one oscillations and the mega fields is a parameter in there and uh, the change in uh, area with the gate voltage uh, being from the parameters we've extracted. And then the parameter we're fitting is an uh, extra phase, the part that we think uh, cannot be attributed to the Arnov bohm phase. So this uh, value in phase will be different uh, one, from, from one region to the other. So we take a, the difference in the fitted value of theta naught uh, to calculate the delta theta. Okay, good, thank you. Um, let's see. I uh, have another question, and this has some follow-ups perhaps um, later on. We can uh, discuss those in the panel uh, discussion, but this one is from Yuval Ronan, and the question is, does the bias measurements of the FP confirms to the edge mode velocity uh, is indeed larger relative to a single well? Uh, so I guess we haven't compared uh, explicitly to a uh, uh, measurements of the velocity to a single uh, interface structure. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, now, it does seem to be that our oscillations are uh, much easier to observe than in uh, devices with, uh, uh, without the screening wells, especially at nu equals one. So I would uh, guess that if we did that experiment, uh, we would find that, uh, but I, we, haven't, uh, we haven't compared to a single well structure, the velocities. Okay, great. Um, was, there, was there a comment? I didn't hear that. Okay, good. Um, so let's see, our time is 11.40. Um, maybe uh, we'll have one last question and then um, the rest of these maybe can be discussed in the panel discussion uh, later on. So the next question is by Suram Praveen. Uh, doesn't the screening well lead to hysteresis or and or drift in QPC behavior? If so, does it stay constant with time and can it be uh, calibrated out? Uh, well, there's uh, some uh, drift in behavior, but not a significant amount and not and it's uh, not something that I would attribute to the screening wells. So the screening wells themselves are uh, also con conducting electron systems. Um, so it's, it's not similar to, for example, a, a doping well sample where the charge in them moves uh, uh, in a glassy way and on a very, in a very slow way. Um, so it, what we observe is the device, uh, at least after uh, applying the gate voltages for some amount of time, seems to be pretty stable and um, uh, not prone to drift, not excessively prone to drift, I should say. Okay. Um, let's... Good. I think uh, we're going to have to stop here.